started in just a second here. Um, while we're getting started, I think I've probably told everybody, but we don't have any slides tonight. John Hogan, um, our audio video guy, uh, just had appendix surgery, so pray for him if you think of it. He's doing good, recovering. But as a result, I don't have any slides. So if you didn't get a handout, you're going to want a handout because we don't have slides tonight. Kevin back there who's blind, I don't know if he can hear me, might not do him any good to have the handout. No, he sees me. Or he might not see me. Such creatures of habit. Everybody's in their same spots. Maybe maybe like a, a seat or two off. I think Sherry and Joe are like a couple rows ahead, but they're still kind of in the same general, general location. So if you guys are joining us for the first time, this is the last um, of a kind of a series thing we've been doing through the summer. We've done eight or nine standalone lessons. We decided to do a theology study throughout the summer while this, this big room was sitting empty. Uh, we decided we would try to be a blessing to our kids curtain holders who serve week in and week out and do something special for them and offer them um, some resources so they can grow. And then of course we've opened it up to the, the entire church. It's not just for them, but, uh, but we wanted to make sure we offered that to them. Um, we've been through some really cool doctrines. We went through the Trinity. Um, we went through uh, the dual natures of Christ and the hypostatic union the doctrine of the church, um, we went through the doctrine of election, I don't remember some of the others, but we, we've, we've gone through some really good stuff, and tonight is the last night, and we're doing the end times by request, and so you guys have really asked for it, I hope that you are uh, prepared to deal with what you've asked for. Before we get started, I'm going to pray for us, and then I do want to say just a couple words about the nature in which we need to approach this subject, okay, so let me, let me pray for us first. Father, your, uh, your word is unsearchable. Your word is uh, so full of your wisdom, so full of your, um, your, your power and your love and everything that's revealed about your character and your plan for redemption. All of these things, Lord, we just marvel at. We look at the way that you have structured this whole world, the way that you have structured your whole plan, and we marvel that you would reveal any of it to us, that you would pull back the curtain and show us any of these secret things. And so Lord, as we approach your word tonight and as we talk about these, um, these figures and these images that you give us to paint a picture of the end times, we pray that you would give us wisdom, you give us humility, and that you would give us a sense of anticipation uh, looking for your return. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let me read something to you from a website called The Voice of the Martyrs. If you've not heard of that before, it's a pretty cool ministry. It reads, a woman in India watches as her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationalists. She doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in a North Korean prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious. The beatings begin again. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She has escaped from Boko Haram, who kidnapped her. She is pregnant, and when she returns home, her community will reject her and her baby. A group of children laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sanctuary are eating together. Instantly, many of them are killed by a bomb blast. It's Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. These people don't live in the same region or even on the same continent, but they share an important characteristic. They're all Christians, and they all suffer because of their faith. While Christian persecution takes many forms, it is defined as any hostility experienced as a result of identification with Jesus Christ. From Sudan to Afghanistan, from Nigeria to North Korea, from Colombia to India, followers of Christianity are targeted for their faith. They are attacked, they are discriminated against at work and at school. They uh, risk sexual violence, torture, arrest, and much more. In just this year, there have been over 360 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 5,898 Christians have been killed for their faith this year. 5,110 churches and other Christian buildings have been attacked this year. 4,765 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Hold that thought and let me read some scripture to you. As I read this, don't worry about, don't worry about your eschatology, don't worry about your, your doctrines or your theology. Just keep that in mind and listen to the word of, what the word of God says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven 
with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there also is a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of the dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of the dust, so are all those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are all those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So Christ, having been offered once to bear sins for the many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, which is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Paul says of communion, for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. John says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, are not from the Father, but from this world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Jesus said, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus ends the revelation of God, saying these words. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them all the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from them the words of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And John says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. The study of the end times is more than an armchair hobby for people who want to try to connect these dots to discover if Barack Obama was the Antichrist or if the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. None of that means anything to these people that are enduring the things that that we see described in the book of Revelation, or at least things that are very similar to the things we see described in the book of Revelation. To them, what end times means is Jesus coming back to rescue them. Jesus coming back to 
to punish the wicked and to set them free from, from the, the awful circumstances that they're in, to make everything right again, to reunite them with their loved ones that have been murdered for the cause of Christ. This is what eschatology is to all of the church in all of history, except for this little pocket of about 150 years in this little part of the world. It's only this little pocket of about 150 years in this little part of the world that treats eschatology as this armchair hobby secret to be unlocked. Everyone else through all of church history and all the rest of the world has seen it as a way to look forward to the return of the king to finish what he started. And so as we approach this subject tonight, um, I want to approach it with that heart. Because as many debates as there are about different theological systems and as many people that leave that leave a church, let me just get on my soapbox here. As many people that will leave a church where, where they have invested in people's lives and people have invested in their lives, where they have served and been served, where they have loved and been loved, where they have grown and helped others grow, as many people that will leave a church like that because somebody else has a different idea about a detail in how Jesus comes back would be absolutely sickening to these people to whom his return means life or death. These people who might die tonight if he doesn't come back tonight. As we approach this subject, I just want to approach it with that heart that our blessed hope is not getting all the details right. Our blessed hope is awaiting our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who when he comes, he will change us in the twinkling, in the blink of an eye. He will swallow up death. Your loved ones who have died in the Lord, you will see and embrace and glorify Christ together. That's what eschatology is. So with that said, the first page on your outline, and uh, again, I don't have slides tonight, so if you didn't get an outline, grab one because you're going to want it. Um, The first page, I'm going to zoom through this, okay? These are just definitions. I'm not going to break any of them down. I just want you to have categories for these words as as we go along and say them. You can go back and kind of dig in further later. And I've titled that working definitions for a reason. These aren't technical by any stretch of the means. Um, this, these definitions are what I mean when I use these words. Eschatology, just a word that means the study of the end times. Consummation uh, means the end of the world as we know it and the making of all things new, the finish of God's plan that we're all looking for. Millennium is either a literal or figurative, figurative thousand-year reign of Christ prior to that consummation. Uh, pre-millennial, ah-millennial, and post-millennial are just three different views of what the millennium is that is described in Revelation 20. In Revelation 20, a period of time that is called a thousand years is mentioned. Uh, Different views see that as a literal thousand years, as a figurative block of time, um, and and the the pre, ah, and post is just where Christ comes. Does he come before that period of time starts? Does he come... Is it already, are we in that? Is the church age that period of time? Or does he come after that period of time is over? And we'll talk more about that later, but that's all those words mean. Dispensationalism, we're not going to talk a whole lot about this, um, but it's a view of redemptive history that was developed in the 19th century that basically divides history into different dispensations, different time periods, usually marked by God dealing with humanity in different ways. It sees a clear divide between Israel and the church, especially in terms of the covenant promises made to Abraham and David. We might get into to that a little bit more later, but it's not super important for our purposes. Rapture is the belief in a secret or invisible coming of Christ to snatch away believers prior to the great tribulation. Great tribulation is a time of persecution for Christians and judgments for unbelievers. Some view it as a specific time period, usually three and a half to seven years. And some view it as a description of this entire age. Those viewing it as an entire age do not rule out a heightened or intensified tribulation close to Christ's return. Kingdom, the way we'll be using it is Christ's rule on earth in whatever capacity relative to one's millennial view. Last days is the entire time period from the coming of Christ to the consummation. Uh, This is not something that's disputed. So uh, remember the consummation is the finishing up of the plan. Him coming, judging the wicked and the dead, uh, uh, judging the wicked and the, and the righteous, raising people up, creating new heavens and new earth. That's the consummation. The last days, uh, it's explicitly clear. just want to get that out of the way. We'll talk about it again. Explicitly clear in the New Testament that the last days started at Christ's first advent. When Christ came, the last age began. Um, Antichrist is an agent of Satan opposed to and possibly in, in imitation of Christ. 
either a specific individual or a, spe or a figurative title of one who fulfills that office or a combination of both. False prophet, also an agent of Satan, teaching a false religion and leading people astray, a spokesperson for the Antichrist and for the serpent, either a specific individual or a fig figurative title of the one who fulfills that office or a combination of both. The beast, the Antichrist or another representation of Antichrists, plural, Serpent, Satan, the fallen angel who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, Jesus in the wilderness. Genre, a category of literature that is to be read in a particular way. This will be important. Uh, prophetic literature is literature that is revealing the message of God in a, with a particular emphasis on the future. And apocalyptic literature is a type of prophetic literature, so it's under that prophetic umbrella, dealing with the end times, and it always has the characteristics of visions, symbols, and pictorial language. Gnosticism is a heretical belief that teaches, among other things, that enlightenment comes through secret knowledge. Um, that's important to note because when we approach the end times as this, uh, this secret knowledge that I have to attain to be more enlightened than somebody else, I need to be aware that that is uh, the, the trappings of an age-old heresy called Gnosticism. Recapitulation is the retelling of the same events, the same story, the same narrative from different angles and perspectives, prof uh, possibly with different emphases. Recapitulation, think of this as uh, when you watch an instant replay during a football game. And you see, you see the view from the drone above, you see the view from the 50-yard line, you see the view from the end zone. And you're watching the same thing, but you're getting different sets of details, different angles, different emphases. That's, that would be recapitulation. Preterist is a method of interpreting the book of Revelation as mostly past, with specific emphasis on the sacking of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Futurist is a method of interpreting the book of Revelation as mostly future. And iterist is the method of interpre uh, interpreting the book of Revelation as some past and some future, but seeing most of the book as recapitulation. Okay, don't worry about understanding all that. I just want you to be familiar with these words. The next thing I want you to look at these diagrams. So when we talk about us being in the last days, what we're talking about is being in the, um, the last period of history in God's redemptive plan. So God wrote a story, and he wrote this story at the, at the beginning of Genesis 1-1, and he's already written the ending. All of creation has, has, is an open book to God. Nothing is, nothing is happening before his eyes that hasn't already been written. And so in that, in that grand story, um, we are in the last phase of that history. Uh, if you look at this neat pattern here on the left in this table, this is, this is up until Christ's birth. So you have the beginning, and the purpose of man is given. Then you have the fall, man's dominion is lost. Then you have a promise, God gives a, a, a promise that he has a plan to restore things. Then you have conflict all throughout the history of Israel as that plan comes to fruition. And then you have arrival when God's promised one comes. Then after Christ comes, look, the cycle starts again. You have the beginning, Jesus is the second man, and his purpose is given to fulfill his, his mission to redeem his people. Then you have the fall, but this time it's the fall of Satan. As, as Jesus accomplishes his, his plan, Satan falls. Then you have the promise that we cling to now, that, that the restoration plan will be consummated one day. Then you have conflict, which is where we are in the story, as we wait for the plan to come to fruition. And then you have arrival again when he comes back, and all things are restored in the consummation. The next diagram there, you see this is just a typical literary diagram for a story. But I think it's really helpful to look at the exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution. If you've ever had a creative writing class, you recognize this thing. What's really interesting uh, is if you, if you look at this, we're on the downward side. We're in the falling action, heading towards the resolution. So I just frame all that with the idea that when we're talking about the last days, we're not talking about this weird period of time that is going to sneak up on us. We're talking about a period of time that has happened since Christ arrived. The advent of Christ was the beginning of the last days. Okay, next line on there is hermeneutics and apocalyptic literature. After we get through some of this technical stuff, um, it'll be a little bit more interesting, I think. Hermeneutics, there's a class on this coming up for midweek. Uh, basically just rules that you use to properly interpret the Bible. Uh, you can't just willy-nilly open up to a random verse and say, I can do all things through Christ who is my strength, therefore I'm going to hit this three right now. Uh, that's bad hermeneutics, right? That, th we, we laugh because we understand that's not a good interpretation of that passage. Well, the reason why we understand it's not a good interpretation of that passage is because we understand that there are inherent rules 
by which we interpret scripture. We look at the context, we look at the writer, we look at who he's writing to, we look at the situation that those people are in. Um, You guys do this in your Bible study and you hear it every Sunday. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. You use these rules all the time to figure out, okay, am I reading this the way that God meant it to be? Um, So when we talk about the end times, much of the information we have about the end times comes from prophetic apocalyptic literature, that gen- those two genres that we just mentioned. And so we have to make sure that when we're reading prophetic and apocalyptic literature, that we're using good hermeneutics, that we're using good rules to interpret it. Meaning, when we see a beast with seven heads, are we thinking that there's going to be this real dragon with these seven heads? When we hear about living creatures with eyes all around them, is God really saying that this is a literal creature with eyes all around them? And the way that you're going to be able to answer that question is by reading the, the passage that you're reading in context according to the genre that it is. In apocalyptic prophetic literature, it's filled with visions and pictures and images, and they're meant to communicate a real reality, but they're not the literal thing. So when it says that these, these four creatures are surrounding the throne of God, it's telling us that he is being worshipped by all of creation day and night, forever and ever. But the communication that he's getting to us is not, I wonder what this creature looks like. Let me try and draw it. That, that's not where he's going with it. He, he's trying to paint a picture of what's happening in heaven, not give us a, a new animal to discover. Um, so, so it's important that when we look at apocalyptic literature that we're reading it according to that genre. That doesn't mean that everything in it is figurative. It just means that we recognize when I open up, I mean, even when you go to Ezekiel and some of the things you read in Ezekiel, um, when I open up to this passage of Scripture, I have to look at it through the lens of the type of writing that it is. Um, you know, just to, to add on to this a little bit more, when you read uh, the book of Psalms, you shouldn't read the book of Psalms the same way that you read the Gospel of Matthew. Because the book of Psalms is, is poetry, it's hymns, it's praise to God. It doesn't mean it's not all literally true. It just means that, that it's a different genre than the Gospel of Matthew, which is historical narrative. So you, you do this inherently. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, I think I've got it later on, but I'll go ahead and spoil it. You do this inherently. Um, an example that I love to use, uh, I, I stole from a guy that I listen to a lot. Uh, some of you guys can guess who that is. But um, uh, he, he says, have you, have you ever uh, read an article or something online, and you're, you're, you're reading it thinking it's a news article, and you get halfway through it, and you think, oh, crap, this is an ad. And then all of a sudden, the way that you read it, what happens the way you read it? Changes. You read it differently. And you wouldn't even say that you read it literally one way and you don't read it literally the other way. You read it literally both ways. But you read it literally according to the type of writing that it is. You're going to read a news article differently than you're going to read an ad for a product. And so we do this inherently. And so the the whole spiel here on end times is that when we're reading prophetic portions of scripture, we need to make sure that we're not just broad brushing and saying, oh, well, I take the Bible literally. Well, you can take the Bible literally and read it according to its genre. Maybe a little more on that later. Um, I do, actually, I do have uh, a couple more examples of this at the bottom there, at the bottom of that page. You remember the, uh, the visions that um, Joseph was given, that his brother got so mad about? You may remember what the vision was. What was bowing down? like wheat stalks, right, or sheaves of wheat. And, and that, that vision, that dream, was pointing to a particular reality. It wasn't just allegory. God was pointing to the fact that his brothers were going to bow down to him. He was giving him a pros- prophecy of something that was to come. Um, but he wasn't showing him that there were going to be literal stalks of wheat bowing down to another stalk of wheat. Same thing with the, the dream that um, Pharaoh got with the, the skinny cow eating the fat cow. And it was representative of a famine. So again, these are just some examples of how prophetic literature or prophetic, yeah, literature should be read. Okay. Next page is the most important page of everything we'll do tonight. Closed-handed issues. When we're talking about eschatology and we're talking about the return of Christ, the end times, these are issues that we all have to agree on in order to be uh, what we call orthodox. Orthodox just means that we operate within um, the within the boundaries of what scripture has revealed. If scripture is is, is ultimately clear about something, um, then that's something that's orthodox. You can't just choose to go outside of that. Where scripture is gray and fuzzy on something, you can have differences of opinion as long as you stay within the bounds. The orthodoxy is the, the bumpers on the bowling lane. 
So here's the close-handed issues. And I'm not going to read all these scripture references, uh, but I just wanted to make sure you see them so I can kind of back this up for you a little bit. The first one is the reign of Christ and the ultimate victory and renewal, the consummation, that he is coming back, that he is on his throne, that he wins, period, that he does away with death, that he makes all things new. Um, this is, is non-negotiable. Uh, if you don't believe this, then you're, you're outside of Christian orthodoxy. Uh, give you one passage there. Uh, look at the second one down from Revelation 5, 12, and 13, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is sa- slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. This point there is everything. Saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Christ is victorious. That's a non-negotiable. Second one, the visible return of Christ. The, the actual return of Christ. Not a figurative return of Christ, not a allegorical return of Christ, but that Christ, the person, Christ, the God-man, is coming back. This is non-negotiable. Second, I'll do the middle one again, Acts 111. Uh, these are the angels speaking to the apostles. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Next one is the resurrection of the living and the dead that all who have died will be raised from their graves, uh, and the the next point is that they will be judged. Well, I'll just continue the pattern and go with the middle one again. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The judgment of the wicked, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. Eternal life of the saved, Daniel 12, 2, that's already, um, that's already cited in one of the other ones, so I didn't put it on there again. And then that no man knows the hour. This is important because we've had all kinds of crazy people throughout the, the years think that they can do this, again, Gnosticism, this secret formula to determine what day that Jesus is coming back. Uh, Jesus himself said that no man knows the hour. Okay, those are the close-handed issues. That is what we have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus is coming back. We have to believe that it's a real visible return. We have to believe that he is ultimately victorious, that all the the dead will be raised and face judgment, that those who have rejected Christ and continued in their wickedness will be raised to judgment and eternal punishment, and that those who have been um, saved by him, by grace through faith, will be raised to everlasting life, and that no man knows the hour. Here's the open-handed issues ones that we can disagree about. The events leading up to the return of Christ, meaning the tribulation, how long it is, is it a specific period of time? The Antichrist, is it just one particular person? Is it one person that's going to be revealed at at the end of the age? Is the Antichrist representative of all world power that sets itself up against Christ? Is it a combination of the two? The rapture, does Jesus come back and, uh, and raise his people out before the great tribulation starts? All of those things are open-handed issues. That doesn't mean that they can all be right, because there's going to be a right and there's going to be a wrong. Uh, but all of those are acceptable beliefs. The nature of the kingdom now. Is the current kingdom of God on earth different from the millennial kingdom described in Revelation 20? That's an important question. Is the current kingdom of God that is on earth now different from the millennial kingdom described in Revelation 20. And then the last open-handed issue that we'll highlight is how we interpret prophetic and apocalyptic texts. This is going back to what I was saying about hermeneutics. So you have to interpret a prophetic and apocalyptic texts according to their genre. You, you can't uh, just take it with a blank check and say everything means exactly what it says it means. Otherwise, you're going to come away with some really weird stuff about a baby uh, in space and a dragon waiting to eat it. Um, so, so we have to be able to interpret it according to its genre, but deciding which parts are taken literally and which parts are taken figuratively is something that's open for discussion. Okay, so there's the close-handed issues and the open-handed issues. The purpose of eschatology we hinted on at the beginning, it's to motivate us to build the kingdom, to warn the lost, and to live in expectation of the return of Christ and the deliverance from the present fallen state. A purpose of eschatology is to provide us with hope for the future. Uh, eschatology, the purpose is not um, a code to crack. We talked about that. 
and then uh, something else to note is that all of Jesus' parables about the end times all came with something he was telling you to do, not just something he was telling you to know. He was telling you to be ready, to be watchful. He was telling you to invest your talents wisely. He was telling you to store up your treasures in heaven. And this should tell us something when we're studying eschatology, um, that what is more important is that we live in expectation of the master returning than we get too bogged down in the details of exactly how that's going to play out. Um, and then the last thing is eschatology does matter. We don't want to minimize it. It matters to God. It matters to, to, uh, to the way that he revealed his word. But it just has to be kept in its proper perspective. And a great analogy to this is baptism. Baptism absolutely matters. The doctrine of baptism is a huge deal. It matters a lot. But our Presbyterian brothers and sisters who believe that babies can be baptized and sprinkled and they have a, uh, a good reason for that. It's not just made up. They believe that the covenant of circumcision was given to, to the babies in that covenant and so the covenant of baptism should be given to babies in this covenant. We believe that they're wrong. We don't believe that that, that, that deviation is unimportant but we would say, as far as our fellowship with them, it, it doesn't affect it. And so this is the way that you should view eschatology. It's important. It matters. But it shouldn't break fellowship. Okay, so here's the part you've been waiting for. Here's the four big views. This chart, um, it goes through some of the crucial questions that are on the left-hand column. And then it's just going to answer for each of the four. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right off the bat, um, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should wait and drink my water and decide whether or not I'm going to tell you. I, the first view, the dispensational premillennial view, which is the standard uh, Tim LaHaye, left behind, everything's the mark of the beast, that typical view is acceptable within orthodoxy. I, I, that is the one view that I feel very confidently saying is incorrect. And I think it's incorrect for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and I think it's even incorrect somewhat for gospel reasons, for the way that they view the gospel, the way that they view the distinction between the Gentiles and Israel and God's plan with those two people groups. Um, so, we'll st again, it's still an acceptable view, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because basically anything that you look up online is going to give you this. Uh, you, can, you can search this view to your heart's content because it's the dominant view in modern evangelicalism. Uh, and you've probably heard from Eric before, it's also a view that's only about 150 years old. Um, so, I mean, that's, that should be a clue to us already. God has had people uh, in the church studying his word, seeking him together in community, w being indwelt and filled by the Holy Spirit, who have been longing for his return for 2,000 years. And, um, and 150 years ago, this secret knowledge appears, and it becomes the dominant view in evangelicalism. I'll leave it at that. Again, it's acceptable. It's not... Uh, it's not off the table. There's some really smart people who view this. Uh, I, I would just rule it out. Uh, so let's just go down. Uh, let's go horizontally. Will Jesus return physically? You say that they all answer yes. Historic premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism. We're going to define these as we go, but they're going to be defined by their differences. So, so don't worry about that. When will Jesus return? After a seven-year tribulation before the millennium, before the thousand-year reign of Christ. Historical pre, after tribulation, before the millennium. Amil says any time, a, a detailed time frame is not important as far as when Christ will return. Postmillennialism says after the millennium, after the um, figurative or literal thousand year reign of Christ is completed on this earth through his people. Do the rapture and second coming occur of Christ occur at the same time? Dispensationalism says no, they are events that are separated either by seven years or three and a half years, depending on how you view that. Historic pre-mill says, yes, they're the same thing. The rapture and the second coming are the same thing. Amil says they're the same thing, and post-mill says they're the same thing. Will there be a great tribulation? Uh, both pre-mill say yes. Amil says the tribulation occurs anytime Christians are persecuted or wars or disasters occur. And post-mill says uh, basically the same thing, but with a heightened emphasis on the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., uh, something that Jesus specifically prophesied about. Will Christians suffer during the persecution? Uh, just to save, save us some words here, dispensationalism says no. That's what the rapture is. They're taken out before the persecution or they're taken out halfway. Um, historic pre-mill says yes, Christians will go through the tribulation before the millennial king, before Christ comes and the millennial kingdom starts. 
amillennialism says that the whole age of the church that we're in right now is the tribulation. And post-mill says basically the same thing. Uh, will there be a literal 1,000-year millennium? Will there be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth? Uh, or dispensational premillennialism says yes, Christ will return, and there will be a reign for 1,000 years. Historic premill says yes. In this one, uh, the 1,000 years can be literal or figurative. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Amil says, no, the, millennial, uh, the millennium is figurative, and it refers to the reign of Christ now during this period of the church through the believers. And then post-mill says, uh, this chart isn't, you'll find variations depending on what chart you look at, but post-mill believes in either one. They'll either say it's a, a literal thousand years that they usher in through the preaching of the gospel and then Christ comes, or that it's a figurative thousand years, meaning a long time that's ushered in and then Christ comes. Almost done. Who saved Christians only in all views? Uh, is the modern state of Israel relevant to the prophecies in Revelation? The only one that says yes to that is dispensational premillennialism. When was this view most held? And then you've got the history down there. Um, became popular about 1860. Uh, historical premill is some of the earliest evidence that we have. And then all mill and post mill are both shortly thereafter. Okay, look at this fun little diagram with the arrows, and now I'm going to explain the views for you. And this should make a whole lot more sense to you. So the main differences in the eschatological views, the main differences in the end time views, all have to do with the millennium. That's why they have the names that they have. The millennium. So in Revelation 20, it talks about a thousand year reign of Christ on earth when Satan is bound. Or on earth, or, or figuratively, either way, a thousand-year reign of Christ. The question is, when does that happen in reference to Christ's return? So you can imagine somebody that's pre-mill says that Christ returns before that happens, and then you can look at the, the diagram there. Um, just skip the first one for now. Look at the second one for, simpl for simplicity. Christ returns, and then you see millennium is after it. So the return is pre-millennial. Amillennial Amillennialism uh, is a bit of a deceiving name because ah is the negation of the word that comes after it. Uh, Amill people don't believe there is don't believe that there's not a millennium. They just believe there's not a literal one thousand year millennium. That the thousand years is meant to be interpreted figuratively in the context that it's given in Revelation for a a very vast span of time. Um, they believe that they have biblical warrant to do to interpret it that way. And so what they would say is that we are in the millennium. That the entire time between Christ's first coming and his second coming is the last phase of human history, is the millennial reign of Christ, and that he is reigning right now through his church by the power of the gospel. Um, and that tribulation, you'll see, is concurrent with the millennial reign. And post-millennialism, which is somewhat similar to Ah Mill, uh, but they believe that the, the period of time that we're in right now could be millennial or already, or it could be yet to come, but they believe as the gospel advances that the world basically becomes more and more Christianized. That government, art, culture, all these things become more and more Christianized. And as the world uh, becomes more and more Christianized by the preaching of the gospel, that, that they are ushering in that millennial kingdom. And that after that is established, Christ comes. So those are, those are the, the three. We'll, we'll skip the dispensational one because it's just an iteration of the historic pre-mill one. But those are the three main views. So, so pre Ah, uh, and post. Christ either comes before, it's already happening, or he comes after. So as confusing as all of this has seemed to you before, I really want to assure you that that's what it comes down to. Everything else is just the implications of how you answer that question. For instance, if you say uh, that, that you are um, Amil, you believe that, we are, that the current kingdom of God that is on the earth right now, again, that's not disputable. The kingdom of God is on the earth. Jesus said so. It's on the earth right now. In what capacity is it on the earth is the question. Is the kingdom of God on the earth in the same capacity as the millennial kingdom that Christ is reigning right now through his people? If you answer yes to that question, then all the other details we argue about are just implications of that answer. So, for instance, uh, during the millennial kingdom, the Bible says that Satan is bound so that he can no longer deceive the nations. If you believe we're in the millennial kingdom right now, then your view on what that means for Satan to be bound right now is going to be vastly different than somebody that's pre-mill. Same thing with the tribulation. If you're pre-millennial 
and you believe in a literal seven years tribulation, and that the church is going to go through that literal seven years tribulation, and, and then Christ is going to come, you're going to interpret that tribulation differently than somebody that's post-mill, that's going to believe the tribulation is indicative of the entire time period that we're in right now. You, you follow me? So the, the main things, uh, it gets so confused, but the main things are, are where you see Christ returning in reference to the millennial kingdom. Pre, he returns before and then establishes it. Ah, his advent was the beginning of it and we're in it. Or post, he comes after we establish that kingdom on the earth through the preaching of the gospel. It really is that simple. Everything else just flows downstream from all of those. So here's what I want you to see. Uh, the similarities in all four of those views. The first person that picks up on this little trick is going to get a prize. Look at these similarities. The first one is that the reign of Christ and ultimate victory and renewal is upheld in all three of these views. I say three because I'm lumping the two pre-tribulation ones together. The visible return of Christ is upheld in all three of these views. The resurrection of the living and the dead is upheld in all three of these views. Eternal life of the saved and that no man knows the hour is upheld in all three of these views. Do you know what that list is? <laughs> it's the list of the close-handed issues that we started off with. And so this isn't, you know, can't we all just get along and we all basically believe the same thing? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is at the end of the day, when we're talking about eschatology, when we're talking about the last things, these close-handed issues are what matter. What matters is that we're living in expectation of the return of Christ, that we're doing it in such a way that we're trying to reach the lost because we know once he comes back, it's done for them. We're living in a way that we will be ready to give an account for our lives for the way that we've lived for him, and we're living in a way that we know that suffering will end when he shows up. That's what matters. Everything else are all details that have to do with how you believe that fleshes out. Bo and I, if you don't mind, friend Bo, uh, we, we talk... Um, we talk a lot about differences in uh, soteriology, differences in the theology of how people are saved, of what God does, whether people are predestined in one way or whether God saw their faith in the future and predestined, all those questions, right? And often when we're talking with somebody about that, what we'll say is we believe the same what, we just disagree on the how. And in eschatology, this is an important distinction, again, I, I don't have many mean things to say uh, about people in regards to eschatology other than the fact if you've left a church, no, I won't say that, but, <laughs> but it's, there, there's no reason to leave a church uh, that is in the bounds of orthodoxy over a difference in eschatological views. And, and the reason is because we agree on the same what. We just disagree on the how. And even, even less important, we disagree on the when. So... To, to drive some application on this, and then we're going to have some questions. Um, to drive some application on this, the things that this should motivate us to are the same things that are in the, one of the second or third columns that I had for you on your outline. When I said why this matters. Eschatology should motivate us to build the kingdom, to warn the lost, and to live in expectation of the return of Christ and the deliverance from the present fallen state. And it should provide us with hope for the future. This is something worthy of your time. Our small group is going through Revelation right now. I can't overemphasize that I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that one view is not right. One view is absolutely right. I don't know that I have that absolute right view. I have a leaning. But one view is absolutely right. And many views are absolutely wrong. And it matters. And it glorifies God. There's a proverb that says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. And that goes hand in hand with something that the Lord to told to Israel when he said, the, the secret things belong to the Lord. The revealed things belong to, your, to you and to your children. And so hand in hand, God tells us, there are some things I'm not going to tell you. And there are some things I'm going to hide because I want you to look for I want, I want you to experience um, not the secret knowledge that's going to enlighten you. I want you to experience the joy of mining the depths of my word. Because listen, I'm sure many, if not all of you, have had this experience when you've gone from one level of personal Bible student to another. And once you hit that other level, something in between happened where you saw a passage and you're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. 
I can't, I can't believe that dot connects with that dot. I have never, I have read that passage a thousand times before, and I've never, hopefully you've had an experience like that. And what you're doing um, when you do that is you're obeying a very important commandment. You know what commandment it is? To love the Lord your God with all your mind. We forget that one. Forget that one a lot. When you, when you do that and, you, and you, you dig deep into the, the depths of Scripture and you mine that truth out and you put this together with that together and then you take it before the Lord and you say, Lord, it looks like you're saying this. It lo- I, I'm going to hold this open-handed and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to build something off of this. When you do that, you're honoring God. And that's what we need to do with eschatology. Okay, so with that, you have this page um, when, you, when you go home. This page will be the one that has like the eight questions on top. That one will probably be the most helpful to you um, as a recap for what we talked about because I know we went fast. And then these charts, what you can do is you can take these charts and put them side by side with those eight questions and you can see a visual representation of how those questions are answered in each view. Um, listen, that will be really fun, I'm just telling you. You don't have to be much of a nerd to enjoy that. You, you take that home. You look at that list, and you look at it as compared to the chart that it's respective to, and I, and I guarantee you you're going to have a good time. Um, also, at the bottom of that list of eight questions, it, it has, like, the, the main passages that we use for eschatology. That's a really good list of passages at the bottom of that. Okay? Um, and then, yes, so that's all I have on that. So I want to open it up for questions. Um, don't be shy, because I know you all probably have some. And I don't want Kevin to go first. Just go ahead and get that out of the way. So the rapture, as you're probably describing it, is an absolutely modern concept. Um, It was unknown to the church for 1950 years. Um, But as I say, as we know it, because that word can be used in different ways. If by rapture we mean when Christ comes, uh, his people are taken up with him, then everybody should believe that. Uh, but the defining mark in this, in this uh, dispensationalism, which has only been around like except for about 150 years, the defining mark in that is that in between now and Christ's second coming, there's this secret thing in between where nobody sees him but believers, and they're lifted up and their clothes are left in the ground and the cars are driving by themselves and the planes crash. That's the movie, right? Uh, th- that view is, is a very, very modern view. Now, that's still acceptable within the realm of orthodoxy, and I shouldn't make fun of it too much because there's a really, really small chance that it could be true. Um, but, yes, it's a very modern view. Yeah, that's a great question. Some of the different views on the two witnesses. So in the book of Revelation, it talks about um, that there will be two witnesses that are going to be testifying to the truth and that they're going to be killed. Um, so, so again, if we're viewing Revelation, particularly that portion of Revelation, as apocalyptic prophetic literature, um, then we have to acknowledge that there's at least a good chance that there's some symbolism happening there um, and that it may or may not be talking about two literal people doing a, 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 an exact thing at an exact point in time. Um, but the different views are, some people believe that um, Elijah and Moses, I think it is, is that right? Or Enoch will be, um, will be sent back or, or resurrected in Moses' case um, and sent to national Israel. Um, I don't particularly like that view. Um, some people believe that it's representative of the law and the prophets. Uh, there's precedent for that in Scripture that the two witnesses that have already been given to the people are the same two witnesses that are going to condemn them in the end, the law and the prophets. Um, There's another view. I just read a third one today. You you remember another? Kevin, you remember another one? The the spirit and the the scripture. Yeah, so, so... in, and this is, this is, that's a really good, important point that you, uh, you helped me to bring up. When we're reading in Revelation, um, even regardless of which one of those, I'm going to still say three views, I- any of those three views that you choose or that you, you hold to, um, even within those three views, you can agree with somebody in another view on a particular thing like that. Because that view, wh- who those two witnesses are, aren't necessarily uh, tied to 
to which one of the other things you believe, particularly with some of that sim symbolic stuff in Revelation, because it can go a couple different ways. Um, I don't think we're given much specific, but we can we can infer uh, because there's a there's a pattern in creation where the Father is creating through the Son by the power of the Spirit. We see this Trinitarian operation in creation, and so we could assume that something similar is happening in the new heavens and new earth. I think uh, you remember at the beginning that this the Spirit of God was hovering over the 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 face of the deep, bringing order to chaos. Good question. Yes, Kevin. Six one six. So six six six. The the number of the mark of the beast. Um, there there are uh, any of you guys have ever heard that have ever heard me nerd out and talk about textual criticism stuff like uh, like the, the actual process of the Bible being translated and and um, and all that stuff. Uh, there, there are different manuscripts, uh, manuscript families. So, for instance, like uh, there's a whole grouping of New Testament manuscripts that have come from Alexandria and a whole grouping that have come from uh, the area near Antioch and, and all these things. And within those different families of manuscripts, there are variants. Now, this is the strength of the New Testament is that less than 1% of all of the variants of the New Testament, less than 1% of all the differences of all the manuscripts that we have, um, have any significance whatsoever. 99.9% .9 of all of the variants that we have are spelling and punctuation. One of the variants between the manuscript families is, uh, is one of the manuscript families translates it as 616, and the other translates it as 666. So if you're a hard wooden literalist and you believe that 666 has something to do with Bill Gates, you're in a lot of trouble. Because there's a good chance that it could be 616 instead of 666. Now, if you're not a hard wooden literalist and you understand 666 to be representative of the number of man, which is how Revelation interprets it of itself, uh, and of, of man's world system, uh, then it doesn't really matter much if it's translated one way or the other. What else? So this is also a good point to mention something Brandon and I talked about recently. Sorry, y'all. My mouth's really dry tonight. Um, something Brandon and I talked about recently with, uh, with interpreting uh, these passages. So you can take a passage and you can say, uh, you know, this is, this is a figurative passage that is pointing to a literal thing. It's not like Aesop's fables. It's not just telling you a moral. It, it has a referent. It's talking about, you know, this, this image or whatever is talking about a real king. and that, So it can, it can be that. Um, but that doesn't mean that every single detail in the description has to have significance. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Jesus telling the parable of the prodigal son. And, um, and you remember at the end of the parable of the prodigal son, uh, the older brother is out in the field. And when the son comes home, the father says, go get the fattened calf and, and, uh, and get it cooked up and let's have a feast or whatever. Well, you could look at that and you can say, what's the significance of that fattened calf? And the answer is nothing. Jesus is just telling a story. It's just a detail in a story. Now, that doesn't mean that, that none of those details have any significance, but you can't look at everything in a parable and say, you know, for instance, the kingdom of God is like a, uh, a seed that you plant in the ground and it grows up and it gets so big that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What's the significance of the birds? You see what I'm saying? It's nothing. He, he's making a point. He's, 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 he's painting a picture. And so we have to be careful when we read Revelation the same way. Again, that's not to say that there aren't these little details that do have these nuggets of meaning. That really does happen. But you just can't look at every little thing and say, why is that that? Because sometimes he's just giving you a picture. Does that make sense? That's huge. That's huge for Bible reading in general. Yeah, I do. Um, so I will speak... Probably more to one view than to the others because uh, if, so, if I say something wrong about somebody else's view, correct me. Um, in the, in the pre-mill view, remember, so Christ's return in reference to the millennial kingdom, that he comes before the kingdom and that he establishes the kingdom here on earth. 
the view is that Satan is, is not bound until then, um, and that is part of what makes that millennial kingdom on earth the millennial kingdom, because Satan is ar- isn't around to do what he does. That, that's kind of how the, the pre-mill views it. And, and all views believe that after the, the millennial kingdom, the, the time span is over, that he's released, and that havoc is, is wreaked again before the final end and judgment of all things. All, all beliefs, all systems hold that because that's, that's clear in Scripture. Uh, so that's pre-mill. Um, Amil and post-mill uh, would, would have different, different nuances to this same answer. They would say that, um, that in that passage, Satan is, and it's Revelation 20, uh, 20 or 19, I think it's 20, um, that Satan is bound, but it gives a specific reason why he's bound. He is bound so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. And then it goes on to say when he's unbound, that he's unbound, that he might deceive the nations, that they might make war with the Lamb. And so the Amil position would say, well, it tells us exactly what the binding means. It means that there was some sense prior to Christ in which he was deceiving the nations that he can't do anymore. And, um, and that position would say that's evident by the fact that all of the world was wrapped up and lost and full of idolatry and there was only one little dot of light in the Middle East for all of human history until the gospel came. And when the gospel came, all of a sudden that light has spread across the globe. And they would say Satan is no longer bound to deceive the nations, that the nations are coming to Christ would be the answer to that. There's a good analogy. Uh, same guy, Michael Kruger. I'm a fanboy. Uh, if you haven't ever heard of Michael Kruger, look him up on YouTube. You're welcome. Um, he, say, he gives this analogy, and he says, you know, say, say I've got a dog, and I've got a, uh, a garden in my backyard, and I've got roses and tomatoes and uh, daisies and tulips, but all the dog ever wants to get into is my roses, and he just wants to dig up my roses all the time. And, uh, and so finally I get tired of the dog digging up the roses, and so I put him on a, on a, on a leash, on a chain, um, but I make sure that chain is just short enough to where he can't get to my roses. And uh, he can still do all the other things, but he doesn't really mess with those things. But, but I just, he's, he's bound in regard to the roses. And so when my friend comes over and he says, hey, where's, where's your dog? I don't see him running around out there. And he says, oh, my dog's bound or my dog's tied up. The friend's not going to say, so your dog can't walk to the other side of the yard and go to the bathroom? The friend's going to understand that the dog is bound or tied up in reference to the thing that it's being kept from. That's the analogy that he gives for the way that Satan is bound so as not to deceive the nations. They both believe that uh, there would be different nuances as to, as to how that fleshes out, but they would both give the same answer as far as the binding. Correct, Kevin? Okay. I know which one he is, so... Yes. So uh, this is super-simplified view, okay? This isn't doing anybody justice, but this is just a very simplified view. You could think of um, uh, premillennialism as being uh, very, very pessimistic in its outlook of Earth's future, that things are going to get worse and worse, and, and when Christ, and they're going to be at the worst they can be when Christ comes, um, and then the postmillennialist is is the opposite, and they believe things are going to get better and better. Um, and as silly as that sounds to somebody who's never heard that before, they believe that that's going to happen through the power of the gospel. They have a, a, a really commendable view of the power of the gospel upon not just people, but culture and government and art and all the things. So they believe that that the world itself is going to get better and better as the gospel influences it. That doesn't mean that everybody becomes a Christian or it doesn't mean there's no persecution. It just means if you can imagine a funnel, um, they're, they're at two different ends of the funnel. I didn't do that good. Come on, give me some questions. Nothing else. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you which one I am. Just kidding, I'm really not. You can probably guess, but if you can't, I don't care. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll end with the way that we began. 
Um, listen, y'all, I don't want to do that. Uh, we have no idea how good we have it here in America, and we should just feel awful about ourselves for how privileged and wealthy and all that. I don't want to be that guy. Um, but there's a real sense in which we all need a dose of that, uh, of, of realizing that not only is it our part of the world that is so blessed, it's our little speck on the timeline. Because even in this part of the world, a couple hundred years ago, it wasn't like this. Um, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching to the Athenians, and he says that God determined the times and places of habitation of every man on earth. And so what that means is that you were born where you were born during the time that you were born because of God's decision. He, you know, just as, just as we would look at somebody that's born into an, a Christian family with parents who love Jesus, and we'd look at them and we'd say, that child is blessed. That child has been blessed of God because they could have been born to a different family in a different way. It's not better than the other person, but we'd say that person is blessed. And so, so that's, that's where we are in reference to Christ's second coming. But what we need to remember is that as we read, uh, particularly the New Testament, and particularly the experience of the church, past, present, and future, as described in the New Testament, we need to remember that we are the glaring exception. We are the glaring exception to the norm of God's people being singled out, and even in the post mill view, of God's people being the aliens in a foreign land. And we, we say all these nice things about us being aliens in a foreign land, and we're travelers, you know, all this stuff. Um, but we don't really know what that's like. And that's okay. We don't need to feel bad about ourselves for that. We just need to acknowledge that, that we need God to give us more of a yearning for Christ's return. Because, you know what? Listen, guys, I love Jesus. I love Jesus more than anything, um, more than anything in this world. And, and I, I love him so imperfectly. But I can stand here honestly with no pride in my heart and say that Jesus is my greatest treasure. But I did not wake up this morning wanting him to come back. I did not want him to come back. The thought just didn't cross my mind. I didn't wake up this morning saying, man, I hope Jesus comes back today. And the testimony of the New Testament is that <laughs> that's what Christians do. Christians wake up in the morning saying, Jesus, I hope you come back today. Let's, let's make all these things right. Let me be with you forever. Let me be with you where you are. My blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has, who has picked out a people for himself for his own possession, that they might tell of his excellencies for all of eternity. So let our eschatology be fueled by that, by a yearning for a yearning. Sometimes you have to, you have to really want the yearning, a yearning for the yearning for Christ to return. That said, let me pray us out.